I know a few good stories. They take place in a corner of America that might seem familiar, yet still manages to surprise. The settings are spectacular, the characters compelling, the action exciting, the plot lines unpredictable. I'm Tom Richardson. Join me as I explore New England's great outdoors, from Candlewood Lake, Connecticut to Caribou, Maine, from the beaches of Cape Cod to the peaks of New Hampshire's White Mountains. Stories are waiting. Let's live them on Explore New England. Explore New England is presented by your New England Ford dealers, your local REI co-op. REI believes a life outside is fundamental to a life well lived. Campers in RV and visitnewengland.com. Additional funding and support for this episode was provided by the South County Tourism Council. South County, Rhode Island covers a large and varied swath of the country's smallest state. Stretching from Narragansett in North Kingstown to Westerly in Hopkinton on the Connecticut border, it comprises long surf-pounded ocean beaches, protected salt ponds and marshes, lazy inland rivers, estuaries, farmland and forest. In the eastern corner of the county, well-protected Point Judith Harbor and the village of Galilee have long provided safe haven and easy access to local fisheries for a fleet of commercial and sport fishing boats. Hundreds of charter and party boats have sailed out of Galilee since the 1940s, and while the boat names and faces may have changed over the years, along with the types of fish and shellfish being landed, the fishermen have adapted altering gear and techniques to harvest what is available. Captain Kelly Smith has witnessed a lot of these changes firsthand. A charter captain since 1989, he runs the Sea Devil II, a 37-foot Duffy Downeaster that allows him and mate Gib Randall to put their customers on everything from tuna and shark to fluke and striped bass. On a bright late September morning, I met Kelly and Gibb for a mixed bag bottom fishing trip along the South County beaches. After casting off, we idled past the commercial docks and through the breachway, built in the early 1900s to allow safe, reliable passage between Point Judith Pond and the open ocean. In the 1930s, a series of breakwaters were built outside the inlet to create a harbor of refuge for ocean-going passenger steamers and other vessels. I grew up on the Connecticut River, so I was always around boats and near boats. And while we were in school, I ended up working for a little marina down there that used to rig boats. And, and one of our customers bought a boat, and he went saltwater fishing quite a bit, so he invited me to go along. So I started fishing with him, and we we're catching blues and stripers out of the Thames River, and that and just grew from there. The month of September marks a transition between the summer and fall seasons for South County anglers. The fish are on the move, which can make finding them a challenge, unless you happen to possess 40 years of accumulated fishing knowledge. Well, most of the reason why I started charting, a couple of my friends had some little smaller kids, and we used to take them out fishing, and just to see, you know, bringing them out and the joy on their face, seeing them catching their first biggest fish, um, you know, it was pretty cool. And, you know, we get a lot of people from, like, the Midwest and upstate New York or whatever and bringing their, you know, 10-year-olds or 11-year-olds out and they catch 32, 34-inch stripers. It's, you know, a thrilling. You know, they're going to remember that forever. So, Kelly, tell me, uh, where, where are we headed right now? Uh, we're going to go down the beach here a little bit. We're outside Point Judith, outside the West Gap. We're gonna go down about five miles, a spot called Nebraska Shoal. It's a little high rocky area. We're gonna try and see if we can find some to talk. It's 
so we're gonna be fishing on the bottom. So we've got crabs for bait. And what you're gonna do is put your thumb on the spool here, pull this lever back, and just keep a little bit of pressure with your thumb. You're gonna let it down so you feel the weight hit the bottom. See how it stops? You put this lever back up. You wanna keep the weight, if you wanna feel it tapping on the bottom, but you wanna keep the line tight so you can actually feel them biting. These guys are the most frustrating fish to catch. <laughs> they have a crusher in their throat. They'll actually suck the crab in, crush it, and spit it out. So it's on that first little tug is when you gotta set the hook. What the trick is usually set the hook before you actually feel it. <laughs> there you go. Feel that? Yeah, yeah. There you go. Nice. What's it gonna be? Oh man, that's a monster scup. There you go. <laughs> well that's the that's the that's the fun part about bottom fishing. It's you never know what you're gonna bring up, right? Oh yeah, yeah. there's the sea bass we're looking for. Nice. <laughs> they are getting bigger. Are. Slowly but surely. That's a good one. 17. We're pretty lucky to have Block Island so close. You know, it's only seven miles off our coast. Um, it holds a ton of fish, ton of bait, pretty much the whole season. If the weather's bad, we can still get in the lee side of the island and still get people out and enjoy themselves. If it's a little rough on one side, they're not feeling too good or whatever, we can find a nice calm area for them and still do really well. Oh, there we go. There's okay. That might be one. Hey, you know what? It's a tog. Hey, be, hey all right. Good. That's our target species. Might be a good one. Hey, actually, it might be a keeper for you guys. They got different colorations on them. Sometimes you see a lot of fish around wrecks and stuff that have that rusty color on them. So it's, it's a great area. You know, all season, pretty much, you know, whatever's in season, starting in May right through uh, November. Way to go. Way right. to do it, Kelly. You know, we have, we have fish the whole time here. That's a real one. Oh, yeah, man. That's a real one. Nice. Yeah! Woo! Right. This, this is a two spot day. <laughs> Leave it to the captain. Nice, nice. nice man. Made it happen. After catching several sea bass scup and tatog, we returned to Point Judith, where I headed down the road to George's of Galilee, an iconic seafood restaurant overlooking the breachway. George's has been serving seafood and other fare from the same location since 1948, and is one of the few restaurants I know of that will prepare the fresh fish brought in by its customers. My name is Kevin and I'm the owner of George's. Uh, I took this place over in 1995 from my father and my uncle, E. Richard Durfee and Wayne Durfee. Uh, they took this restaurant over in 1969 from my grandfather and grandmother, Norman and Edna Durfee, who started George's back in 1948. Before that, it was a small little shack and it was owned by someone named George and it was known for uh, its coffee and donuts back in the day. We're lucky, number one, for being located right in the port. So most of our seafood comes right out of the port here. So obviously it's fresh, but how do we stay on top of the times? We don't have to keep up with the Joneses as much as a lot of other restaurants that completely uh, change its menu. We have so many signature items that we would have a riot outside if we ever got rid of fried clams or fish and chips. So given the size of this fish, we're gonna cook this at 385 at a lower temperature for longer. If you were cooking this at home and you had a slightly smaller fish or even a bigger fish, I would recommend changing the oven temperature accordingly. So we are located steps from the Block Island Ferry. So there are thousands of people that come in, boat after boat, that get here after they've had fun on the island and they're hungry as heck. We're a, a destination restaurant. People have to wake up in the morning and say, you know what, let's go to Georgia's. They bring their fishing rods, you know, they bring their beach blankets and they'll come here for lunch and they'll come here for dinner. What I think makes Georgia's special is our Rhode Island clam chowder. A recipe created by Kevin Durfee's ancestor, Thomas Durfee, 
who arrived in America in 1660 and settled in the Tiverton area. Thomas eventually became friends with Wamsutta, brother of the Wampanoag chief Metacomet, who taught Durfee about how to prepare quahogs or hard-shelled clams, which Durfee eventually added to his English broth-based chowder. Hence, the birth of what is now known as Rhode Island clam chowder. We've seen generations of people come here. We have people that come here and they, they say that, geez, I met my husband here. I used to work here back in the 60s. And now uh, we're taking our you know kids and our kids now are with us and they're taking our grandkids. So it seems like it's a generational thing. South County is just a great place to bike because we have the ocean. We can get in, as you see out here, just away from the ocean, away from people. While fishing remains one of the top outdoor pursuits in Rhode Island's South County, others choose a different form of ocean-based recreation. Surfing has been popular along the local beaches since the 1960s. And one person who was there since the early days is Peter Panagiotis, better known as Peter Pan, who can usually be found riding the swells along Narragansett Beach. Uh, I've surfed all over the world. I've been very fortunate to have done that. I've surfed in contests in Australia, uh, Hawaii, everywhere. And this is my favorite spot to surf right here at the Narragansett Town Beach. Uh, it's the least crowded. There's plenty of room to surf. The waves are good. As a matter of fact, we have the best surf, I think, on the East Coast in Rhode Island. We have more reefs and more point breaks than any other place, and that's why we get crowds from all over the place coming here. There's a reason for it. Because we always tell everybody, stay in your own beach, but they don't, they come here. <laughs> uh, I've been teaching surfing since we opened the other surf shop, the Watershed, 1978, because I didn't want to sit in the surf shop, so I came up with the plan to teach surfing, and I managed to, it managed to work out quite well. I love winter surfing, because first of all, the crowd is cut down like 75%, and the waves are better, and it's just really good to surf in the winter, it's fun. And as long as you have the right equipment, you're all set. When we first started surfing in the early 60s, the wetsuits were horrible. We were using diving suits with the clips, and uh, they just leaked, and we had real bad rashes because they were diving suits. And they started uh, developing surf suits in the early 70s. I love teaching people how to surf that really want to learn how to surf. If somebody's dead serious about surfing and they're in good physical condition, I will take them surfing. Just a short walk from where Peter Pan rides the waves on Narragansett Beach is a portal to South County's inland venues. The William C. O'Neill bike path stretches 7.2 miles between Narragansett and West Kingstown, but it's just one of several interconnected bike paths that wind throughout the county. I sampled a section of the trail on a short ride with Jim Walsh, owner of Stedman's Bike Shop in Wakefield. South County is just a great place to bike because we have the ocean. Um, you can go out and see beautiful scenes there. We can get in, as you see out here, just away from the ocean, away from people, out to, you know, into Exeter and, you know, even head towards Connecticut. So just a great starting point, we believe. So what are these, like, big fields that we just biked, biked along here? The uh, URI's farm. It was originally an agricultural school. Yeah, but I guess you see all kinds of bird. I mean, we are seeing a lot of bird life in these uh, overgrown fields. It must be, you know, especially during the migratory period, like right now. You head out towards the uh, Great Swamp. Mm -hmm. A lot of bird watchers love, you know, over the swamp areas and sure. nesting out there. I actually started biking in the 80s at the, at the high school I went to, oddly enough, had a cycling team. I ended up at URI uh, for, for school. They had a club, but it would also, if any given weekend, if you wanted to race, there's the USCF cycling. Um, landed at Stedman's as a summer job. Stayed on until finally, eventually started purchasing it for Mr. Stedman. W.E. Stedman, Everett's father, started it in the 20s as a general store that sold bicycles and other things, even gas, Atlanta gas. In the 60s, Everett uh, turned it to all bicycles. I arrived in the mid-80s after high school. And hey, don't leave me in the dust here, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
and you come over the top of the beach, it's like a different world. Wow, Chris, that's pretty cool. That's worth the paddle right there. From exposed ocean beaches to fields and woods, the makeup of South County covers a wide array of habitat. And between these two realms lies the series of shallow protected salt ponds that are so important to numerous species of birds, fish, and shellfish. In Potter Pond, just west of Point Judith Pond, the Matunic Oyster Farm has been growing shellfish since 2002. The company was founded by Perry Rasso, who spent most of his youth exploring the waters of South Kingstown through clamming, fishing, and diving. After graduating from the University of Rhode Island, where he studied aquaculture and fisheries technology, Perry began leasing seven acres on Potter Pond as a site for his oyster farm. People always say, you know, you, I can't believe you succeeded in the restaurant business without any restaurant experience, and because that's the most difficult business in the world. And I think people that say the restaurant business is the most difficult business in the world have, have never tried growing an oyster, because growing an oyster uh, it takes, you know, uh, three years before you see any return at all. In 2009, he purchased a former restaurant on the pond, mainly as a place to store his gear and process oysters, but also began selling fresh seafood directly to the public. Over the ensuing years, Perry grew the unassuming eatery and market into the hugely popular and highly acclaimed Matutic Oyster Bar. And that's the story of how a hardworking oyster farmer became a successful restaurateur. The Matunic Oyster Farm offers tours of the farming operation in Potter Pond aboard its large stable pontoon boat. Farming takes place year-round in all kinds of weather, but on this fine fall day, the farmers had it pretty good. You must be Oliver. <laughs> hey, I'm Tom. Oh, good to have you out. <laughs> Taking you guys for a little ride, walking through the system, showing you how we grow our matunic oysters right around the corner on Potter Pond. Most of the ponds on the southern coastline of Rhode Island, very slowly over time, they just filled in with seawater, creating some of our very famous salt ponds that really kind of border the Atlantic Ocean. And they become quite famous, these estuaries, for holding on to a whole lot of life. Biodiversity, all different species of shapes and sizes. We're two salt ponds separated from the open ocean. It's got a slight freshwater influence on this pond that, you know, most of these salt ponds have. And in my opinion, it gives them a tunic oyster, kind of slightly sweeter, more buttery taste, I always like to say. Uh-huh. So, so the, the, the type of water that they grow in affects the flavor. Absolutely. It really is all based around location, any aspect of the flavor. So the oysters are moving from these bags to trays so they can get more water flow and then eventually grow to market size, which will be in the restaurant. Now I notice that there, there's some that like are much smaller than the others though. Like what's the reason behind that? Are they just not getting enough nutrients? Yeah, it's kind of, it's a big competition once they're in the bags to like, they'll compete for the best water flow. We're pretty close with all of us since we're together all day, every day. I learned so much from these guys because they're all fishermen. I never grew up fishing or anything. It's definitely challenging. I think it's physically challenging, but also mentally, because you have to mentally prepare yourself to be okay out in the cold. But I, I started to learn to love it. It's awesome. I get to see the sunrise and sunset, which makes it cool. Along with oysters, the Matunic Oyster Farm also raises bay scallops and maintains an organic vegetable garden. All of this product, as well as locally sourced fish and lobster, eventually finds its way to the restaurant in the form of delectable dishes, including raw oysters, oysters in bourbon sauce, fried oysters, passion fruit oysters, lobster pizza, stuffed lobster, and blackened yellowfin tuna. The restaurant also serves a variety of soups, salads, sandwiches, and vegan items. Perry Razzo is well aware that his success depends on the health of the marine environment, particularly that of the salt ponds, which face many challenges, ranging from nitrogen overloading to rising sea levels. To learn more about the salt pond ecology, I joined Chris Fox, executive director of the Wood Pawkatuck Rivers Watershed Association, for an evening paddle on Ninigrit Pond in Charlestown. The pond is an ever-changing environment. 
Um, it was created during the last ice age when the glaciers retreated. Um, the barrier beach that we're paddling to is actually always in retreat. So technically the pond gets a little bit smaller every year. Uh, but that barrier beach creates a nice backwater area of salt water for a whole variety of both fish and bird species. We also have plenty of furry animals that rely on the pond too. You'll, we'll actually at some point tonight see, see a deer swimming. And you know, it's weird. It, it almost looks like the Florida Everglades. Yeah, it kind of does, especially with all those birds that are walling around in that grass. Yeah, and then you've got these like hummocks and stuff yeah. and, the, and the marsh grass growing up. It's really, it's really cool back here. So Chris, where, where are some like places that the public can access Ninigrit Pond? Well, that's a great question and there's a whole bunch of different places. So in the wildlife refuge at Ninigrit Sanctuary, there's a public boat launch, but that's for canoes and kayaks and paddle craft only. But there's also a boat ramp at the Charlestown Breachway that will get you into the pond with your outboard motor. And right next to the Charlestown Town Beach, there's also another paddle craft launch point. After paddling due south through the pond, Chris and I beached our kayaks and made our way down a narrow path that led through the barrier beach dunes. So Chris, so boaters and paddlers, you know, can come over to, you know, behind the barrier beach and, and beach their like kayaks and if you have a skiff or something. Yep, throw an anchor out with your skiff and hop out of the boat, walk right over the barrier beach. There's probably about six different places along the backside of the beach where you can easily walk across on a path. Then you get on the other side and you have the beach to yourself. Right? Yeah, and you come over the top of the beach, it's like a different world. Wow, Chris, that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's worth the paddle right there. Voila. The best part is this, this particular beach in the middle of the summertime, you can have easily 100 yards between you and the next person on the beach. Woodpock Attack Watershed Association. So it's a local nonprofit. It's all fresh water and it's there in part to protect the National Park Service's Wild and Scenic Rivers designation. So Rhode Island actually has like the most miles of wild and scenic rivers out of all the states in the country barring any of the federal land, so all that being non-federal land. So I get to spend my entire day playing in the fresh water at work to come home and play on the salt water when I get home. So I have the best of both water worlds. From protected salt ponds and sprawling beaches to inland forests, fields, and rivers, Rhode Island's South County offers a remarkably diverse array of habitats to explore. And with that diversity comes myriad ways to enjoy the outdoors and appreciate nature. For a small slice of America's smallest state, I'd say that's pretty impressive.